The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. All right, open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Tenth chapter. And we're looking at verses 15 through 18. The reason I went in and, and, and came back to Hebrews, uh, just looking at Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, is that this last, last year, for some reason, the earlier part of this year, or maybe the last part of last year and the early part of this year, I kept running into people that had no, I mean, people had been in church for a long time, talking with them, young pastors, um, really didn't have any concept of the new covenant. Um, they were aware of the term, but not of any what it meant. And I would say, well, give me one, just give me one doctrine of the new covenant that you're familiar with, that you like, that you teach in that. And they struggled with that. So I thought, well, I think I'll come back this year and I think I'll do chapters 8, 9, and 10, which really pound it. Now, the first uh, 10 chapters pound it, the superior of the new covenant over the old covenant, Wow. But I thought, I'm going to come back and, and really pound the doctrines because when you get to 8, 9, and 10, he's really pounding doctrines. And so that's why I'm doing 8, 9, and 10. And so we're in 10, and we've slowed down just a tad bit in it because this is uh, where you get a lot of doctrines of the new covenant. Um, for example... Forgiveness, J just the concept of forgiveness is different in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. A lot of the doctrines that come out of the Old Testament uh, have a real twist to it in the, under the New Covenant because of the completed work of Christ on the cross. Redemption is completed. Uh, it wasn't completed in the Old Testament. It wouldn't be completed in the Old Testament. Christ came and completed it, right? Everything in the old waited on the Messiah to come and fulfill the law. And so, um, anyhow, it, so it makes, it makes it kind of interesting. And I felt like of all, all people, we should be on the top of this game. Uh, verse 15, he says, And the Holy Spirit also bearing witness to us. The Holy Spirit bore witness uh, to the old covenant, bore witness to the coming of Christ, bore witness during the coming of Christ, bore witness to the disciples. <clears throat> and now the writer of Hebrews talks as if the new covenant is established, and it is. In fact, it is in this a passage that we get a lot of information about that. The Holy Spirit also bearing witness to us, that would be church age believers, for after saying, now this is the Holy Spirit, for after saying, and he shows you, and he's going to quote, now he's going to do some really interesting things, and it will serve you well, not tonight, but in, at some point, to go back and read the original text of the New Covenant out of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Because all the writer's going to do here is quote parts of it. Because he's after doctrinal principles that have been fulfilled with Christ dying on the cross, being buried and raised from the dead the third day. Because it is at that point when he ascends back to the Father and is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, a new covenant is instituted. And so he's only interested in quoting things that are important now to the new covenant fulfillment of specific doctrines. So here we are. We're in verse 16. He begins to quote. 
if you have a study Bible, you can look over in your footnote or your parallel or what, whatever, your cross-referencing or whatever, and you're going to see he's going to quote part of Jeremiah 31, 33, right? So here's what he says. And you'll only know that once you compare them. <laughs> this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. That's an important phrase. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law upon their hearts or within their hearts. And upon or within their mind, I will write them. Then he says again, referring to the Holy Spirit. Then he says again. And if you have a study Bible, look over there. Now he's into Jeremiah 31, 34, right? Yes, he is. And he's only, part, he's only quoting part of it. He says, and their sins and their lawless deeds, if you have a King James Bible, they probably said iniquity. Lawless deeds are iniquity. Yeah, what? Lawless deeds are iniquity. Verse 17. Do they say lawless deeds? Mm -hmm. It is. Out of Jeremiah 31, 34, they're going to call it iniquity. And iniquity is now understood as lawless deeds. It, it, lawless deeds. It, 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 that's what iniquity meant in the Old Testament. And so what they did, the Septuagint translated it as lawless deeds. It is the word iniquity, which means lawless deeds. And their sins and their lawless deeds or works, I will remember no more. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sins, for sin. And that's the key to the new covenant in this. And so after, after a word of prayer, we're going to come and we're going to take a look at this. I'm going to break it down and show you some things. And what this lesson is about is about chapters 8, 9, and 10, and now we're closing down in chapter 10, and the writer is, is showing us now by only quoting partial of verse. Look, 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 just for a minute. Look over in chapter 8 for just a moment. Look at chapter 8. Now, the reason he could do that is for two reasons. He's already quoted the entire Jeremiah 31 through 34 in the 8th chapter, I think about verse 7. See in verse 7, you, if you have a study Bible, it says New Covenant. Something like that. Well, yeah, see, First Covenant or New, yeah, Old Covenant for, is called the Old Covenant. And, and the New Covenant is called the Second Covenant. Now, in verse 8, down through 13, when he makes a conclusion, see, 7 opens it up and 13 closes it. 8 through 12 is Jeremiah 31 through 34. Jer Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. That's absolutely right. Now, so he's quoted it all to them. He, they have studied it, okay? So now we're in chapter 10. He goes back to that, but now he quotes part of it. Okay? And then he makes a conclusion. He makes a conclusion with this one as well. In other words, 15 opens it, 18 closes it. 18, 15 opens our text, 18 closes it, and he's only quoting partial, and he, and he does a little bit out of 31 and a little bit out of 34. Because his interest is the doctrines of the new covenant. He is establishing new covenant doctrines and how they've changed, like forgiveness, for example. See, the sin issue. At what, what has to be required to take care of the sin issue and how is it that God remembers sin no more? Okay. Okay, well, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into this. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality nor can you apply it in carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. It could be in at least three categories, mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, and avert sins. It's your responsibility as a believer priest to examine your life in regard to personal sin. 
Holy Spirit can't minister the truth of the word of God to your life, can't bring it into truth in your soul, except through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We're new covenant people. Everybody has the Holy Spirit, so this is a, a capable thing to be done if you confess your sin. And so you have to self-examine in regard to mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or first sin. If you're aware of them, then confess them. First John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. That cleansing brings you back off the work of Christ uh, in, of your salvation into your spiritual life in recovery from carnality. And so you're back to a spiritual status for the study of the word of God. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us tonight, both by automobile and by internet. We pray both, especially for those in the internet, not sitting in a classroom. You've got to have a classroom mentality, shut down all the distractions, your cell phones, television, all of those things. Isolate yourself for this one hour to study with us. It is very important for the Holy Spirit to have your full attention in order to minister the truth of the word of God to your souls tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the writer of Hebrews quotes partial verses. And if you didn't want to go all the way back to Jeremiah later, you can compare uh, chapter 8 with this chapter 10 because he quotes it there. He quotes part of Jeremiah 31, 33 and part of Jeremiah 31, 34 in our lesson text. And I recall your, recall your attention to chapter 8, 7 through 13. What is interesting about when we studied Hebrews 8, it's been so long ago you've probably forgotten it. But in Hebrews 8, 7 through 13, somewhere in your notes, the writer made two important comments regarding the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. These are well worth your attention. For example, in the, in the first comment he makes in Hebrews 8, 7, he says, for if the first covenant had been faultless. Now, that's a second-class condition. That if is a second-class condition which means contrary to the fact. And it should, be read, it should read something like this. Remember, you got an if and a then. For if the first covenant had faultless, but it wasn't. There would have been no occasion sought for a second, but there was. Why? For finding fault with them. And then he says, and then he goes on to quote. Okay. That's a very important, the first covenant, the first covenant had fault. Right, couldn't bring redemption. What was the fault? Not that, not it didn't, not the fact that it didn't come from God. It's that Christ had to come to bring it into a completion. Christ had to come, die on a cross, be buried, raised from the dead, ascend back to the Father, seated at the right hand of God the Father. All that had to be, take place in order for it. It's under fault until that is accomplished. It has nothing to do with, you understand that? That's why in the ninth chapter, we, we, he, the writer talks about eternal redemption. Remember that? Hebrews 9, 12. That's why it has fault. Not, not that the word of God, the old covenant, didn't come from God and all of that business. That's not the issue, Right? Okay, let's make sure we know that. Because I'm telling you, you're in the minority right now. Now, you're the majority of the church, but the minority of Christianity understands that. <clears throat> People think they lose their salvation and all that stuff. They get crazy with this passage. They don't study enough. I guess, I don't know. The second comment that's worthy of this is found in the 8th chapter, verse 13. Now, remember, from 7 to 13, he's quoted the new covenant prophecy, the prophecy of the new covenant. The second comment that he makes, when he says a new covenant, watch this, he has made the first obsolete. The first covenant is the old covenant, so we call it the Old Testament. That's why it's called the covenant. A new covenant, he has made the first 
or the old covenant obsolete. But whatever is becoming, and this is really important to the dating of the book of Hebrews. There is a lot of debate, not only on who the writer is, but the dating of the book. And why there is such discussion is beyond me. We know from this verse that it had to be before 70 A.D. A new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now listen to what the writer says. Whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. You know how it's going to disappear? 70 A.D., Rome's going to come in, put them under the fifth cycle of discipline. It's going to force them. It's going to force them to go into the new covenant. It's going to force them. Mm -hmm. it, I say force, I mean divine discipline. We know the fifth is divine discipline at max. So Hebrews 8.13 tells us, he would never, the writer would never said that. Right? It was obsolete and destroyed. It's gone, kaput, but it wasn't. But it will soon be, right? It was growing old and soon to disappear. So we're talking from 30 AD to 70 AD, 40 year period. He's in that 40 year period when he writes this. We think it, we, many believe it was close to it, the, what, just the way he talks about it. But they've had 40 years of this type of teaching. And it kind of baffles him that people haven't got it yet. It baffles me. I've been here 44 and it baffles me. So I understand his position. I want to talk about four aspects of establishing new covenant doctrines. Number one, old covenant law and new covenant grace have one thing in common. It's about the only thing. But they have one thing in common based on the word of God. They both point us to Christ as the only source of grace salvation. That's true. That's true under the old covenant. It's true under the new covenant. By now, you understand 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. Romans 1.16 says, the gospel, which I just described, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You don't save yourself. Everybody who saves himself can lose himself. There's, there's your loss of salvation. Ephesians 2.8.9, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. I mean, that's just a few passages, but just the ones I like. In Galatians 3, 20, 21 and 22, he says, Paul writes the other great book on the subject. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? That's not why it was faultless. That's not why it became obsolete. It was faultless because it was intended to point you to Christ. When he came, he would fulfill it. Then it was kaput. May it never be. For if, this is second class condition, contrary to fact. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, but what? There was none. Could not impart life nor righteousness. The law, that was not the intent of the law. Cannot give you eternal life, cannot give you right, absolute righteousness. If the law had been if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, but it wasn't, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law, but it isn't. But, in contrast, the scripture has shut up everyone under sin. That's Adam's sin. That's universal sin. That's Adam's original sin, Romans 5.12. So that, divine purpose, so that the promise by faith Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That's pretty powerful stuff right there. 
later in that passage, verses 24 and 26 out of Galatians 3, therefore the law had become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that, divine purpose, we may be justified by faith, but now that the faith, and there's a definite article with it, like there is with the law, therefore he's contrasting the law and the faith, therefore, so that you may be justified, but now that faith has come, what is he talking about? He's talking about the faith that has come in Jesus Christ fulfilling that whole promise so that we now have it by grace. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, the tutor that leads us to Christ, for you are all, all, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, I'm telling you, Galatians is just a powerful book in it. I mean, it is a grace book. It's an early book, too, and Paul was really pounding it. And he, I, you know what I like about the book of Galatians? One of the books I'm going to teach next, next year, well, one of the things that, about it, it's simple. It's simple theology. It's not complex like later in Paul's writing. He gets kind of complex. Galatians is so simple. I mean, it's just boom, there it is. And it's a great book, and, and next year we're going to study that book. It's a good book for new people and young people, people coming into the faith, people that are not aware of how grace really operates and all that. It would be a great book for us. The law points out clearly that no one, listen, here's what the law does. The law points out clearly that no one keep it, can keep it 100%, 100% of the time. And yet it requires it. So you're set up for failure. Then you go, well, what can I do then? And it points you to Christ. See, that's the point. The law points out clearly that no one can keep it 100%, 100% of the time, and therefore it is faulty in producing salvation, righteousness, eternal life on the basis of grace, and on the basis of where it can't do it on works. It can only be done in grace. And James 2.10, in James 2.10, we will learn that if you stumble, stumble now. I don't mean fall down and break your neck. If you stumble in one part of it, you're guilty of the whole kit and caboodle. You know a kit and caboodle? Okay, as long as you know what I mean. Don't, don't anybody raise your hand and ask me what a kit and caboodle is. I just know what it means. I have no idea where it came from. But I know before the class is over, somebody will tell me. That's the kind of church I have. Tum stumbling in one aspect. I mean, just stub your toe. Boom, you're done. Stub your toe. Who wants to be under that? That's the law, buddy. That that's fearful, isn't it? Stub your toe and you're done. Boy, nothing. Not much, huh? Not enough to get me back up on my feet. Not, not too good. That's James 2.10. Here's the second point. The writer of Hebrews makes an emphasis that we often miss in the prophecy of Jeremiah of the new covenant. The writer emphasized after those days. Now, when you read, let me go back to eight. I'm back to chapter 8 because I'm going to read to you from chapter 8, Jeremiah 31, 34. 31, 31 through 34. Listen to how Jeremiah opens where, where he begins his discussion on the new covenant in chapter 8, verse 8. Behold, days are coming. Behold, days are coming. Do you see that? Let's go back to 10. If I get after. 
Behold, days are coming. The writer, the writer puts in, behold, days are coming. He puts in, it's probably come out of the original text. He puts in there after those days, he makes a big emphasis that, oh, it's in the Septuagint. After those days, behold, days are coming. And then the writer goes on to emphasize that after those days have come. In the Hey, I'm going to tell you, it, I don't know how many study in the Septuagint. There's a few in my church that do, especially those that are language people. They study. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old, of the Old Testament. For those of you that look, have a Septuagint, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do a favor for you because if you, if, you if you look up Jeremiah 31 and are looking for the new covenant, you will not find it. You have to find it in Jeremiah 38. So I did you a favor. It is found in Jeremiah 38, 34. On page 952 in the Septuagint, I'll save you a lot of headache trying to find Jeremiah 31. I can tell you that. That's a special note to those who do look at the Septuagint. You will not find it in Jeremiah 31. The Septuagint breaks down the whole book of Jeremiah, kind of interesting to start with, but for the rest of you that don't care a hoot about about <laughs> and that's probably most of you. This is for a few. After those days is a reference when the writer makes this in Hebrew, in, uh, in in the aspect of of the new covenant. After those days is a reference to Jeremiah thirty one thirty two, and a reference to the importance of the fulfillment of this messianic prophecy. Behold, days are coming. And what we know those days were, were the incarnation of Christ, the introduction of Jesus Christ, first by virgin birth, then by John the Baptist, then by the cross, then by the empty tomb, then by his going back, Acts 1. Behold, days are coming when I will make a new covenant, not like the old covenant. Behold, the days are coming. The writer says, now after those days, also when he said a new covenant in Hebrews 8.13 when he said a new covenant he has made the first obsolete whatever is becoming obsolete has disappeared that's also that's also a principle of the seventh chapter of Hebrews verse 22 then in Hebrews 10 9 and 10 he says then he said behold I've come what, what, look Listen to me. You, I bet everyone in this room by now is familiar with the idea that in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was in that deep state of prayer and looking, going to the cross, he, he, he comes to this verbal prayer, not my will, but thy will be done. And that's a big deal, right? Remember, remember, he makes that a big deal. It's in the 26th chapter. I think I wrote it on your paper somewhere. Yeah, it's in the 26th chapter, 39 through 42. Well, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 9 and 10. Now, listen to me. The writer gives us a clue to where Jesus got that idea from in the Old Testament. He's talking Bible doctrine in that prayer. When he's praying, not my will, but thy will be done. He's quoting scripture. What he's quoting, and the writer tells us this of Hebrews, is Psalms 40, 6 through 8. I put it on your paper. He's quoting. You know, everything about the crucifixion is right down on the money of scripture. Everything he does is fulfilling you see, for the writer of Hebrews, it is important that Christ fulfill the messianic passages 
of the first coming to qualify to complete redemption. And there is one of them. This whole idea, not my will, but thy will be done, as Jesus speaks it and then carries it out on the cross, is right out of Psalms 40, 6 through 8 to the writer of Hebrews. And I think he was right on the money. Not that he needs my approval, I need his. Then he said, this is, now he's quoting from uh, Hebrews uh, 10, 9 and 10, which we've already studied. And he said, behold, I've come to do thy will. See that? Now what he's saying in the Gar Gethsemane? Is that what, that's what he said in Gethsemane. I have come to do thy will. And here is the purpose. To take away the first, the old covenant, in order to establish the second. See, he knew that in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's, he, he is gearing himself up by the word of God to face the most difficult task in his life. And so should you, dear hearts. So should you. It gives you the right frame of mind to face your difficulties. I mean, everybody... Even myself, when I used to read Gethsemane, I never, I went, boy, I mean, this was really tough. And so, but listen, what I learned was what he was doing from the writer of Hebrews. What he was doing was holding on to the word of God that says, this is why you came into the world to go to the cross. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be terrible. And you hold on to this. You are doing my will, son. You are doing my will. And, and listen, that's sufficient for me. And there's where you get the strength to carry forward. When he, when he says, be strong in the strength and the power of God's might. You know where that comes from? It comes from the confidence in the word of God of Romans 4.21. He will never, whatever he's promised, he's able to do. He's not going to leave you hanging. If he does, he'll give you the strength to get through it like he did his son. And let me tell you, you know what his son depended on on the cross? The word of God. There's a lesson for all of us. By this will, he says, by this will, to do that will, by this will, that, that by this will is Psalms 40, 6 through 8. For by this will, Jesus fulfilling that Psalms 40, 6 through 8 on the cross. By this will, we we. By this will, we have been sanctified. Because Christ was faithful to fulfill the plan of God in his life. He went through some terrible stuff, but God gave him the strength to bear it through. And he didn't do it for him. He did it for us. Because he bore our sins, not his. He bore our sins. And not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, 2. What a wonderful... I mean, this passage is just dynamite. For by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. I love that. Point three. The writer of Hebrews emphasizes the importance of the indwelling spirit to every new covenant believer. By that, I mean the one who believes the gospel of grace salvation. How do I know that? Well, listen, listen to what he says. I'm back over here. Um, 10, he says in 15, for the Holy Spirit also bears witness to what? Right? All right. Ho hold your place there a moment. Let's go to let's go to John. Let's go to John. Not go to the John, but let's go to John. Let's go to John. Oh, John 15. I think it's on the back side the on the back side of your paper. It's 15 26 through 27. Uh, I'm just going to jump ahead of it. I want you, I want you to see this point. What was my point? We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit living in us, right? We have the Holy Spirit, and it's the Spirit that tests. Listen, when he says, over here, he says, 
And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. Watch, watch how this works based on the fact that Christ went to the cross, was buried, raised from the dead, ascended back to the Father, seated at the right hand of God the Father. 15, what, 26. When the helper, comforter comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will what? Bear witness of Christ. And you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. You will bear. How is that? Holy Spirit. The indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so he makes emphasis. He emphasizes that in this lesson. And he, and he got that. And he, in your italics, in verse, what, 17, he says, in ver, no, verse 18, then he says, notice that's italics. That's not, he just puts that there because he's still talking about the Holy Spirit. And now he's teaching us. He taught him, now he's teaching us. We receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. This is the only thing Paul says in Galatians 3, 2, and 3. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by hearing it with faith? The answer is with faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, what, what begun what? That the Christian life brought in by redemption, uh, regeneration. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? See, he, listen what he does. He, he, he contrasts flesh and faith. Flesh works, faith grace. That's, Paul, that's the message of Paul out of the book of Galatians. You should also, did I put John 14, 16, and 17? Okay, that's important. Listen, people have trouble about where faith comes from. Uh, there's more views on where faith comes from than you can imagine. I mean, you might as well have a bird fly in. Listen, the truth, is, the truth of this is very simple. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. That's where faith comes from. It doesn't come from a missile or an airplane or a bird. I don't know where people got the craziest ideas where faith comes from. Listen, faith must have a working object. The working object is where the glory is. It's where the, it's the, it, it is what gets the job done. If it's the gospel, then the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. If it's a situation in your life, if you need a problem-solving device, it is categorical Bible doctrine applied by faith. Boom, there it is. Why does it work? It's based on the character of God, not on the character of the one who's seeking faith. It's based on the character of God. Listen, faith comes by what? Hearing what? The Word of God. And who backs that up? Who backs the Word of God up? Yeah. It's not my word. Who backs it up? That's Romans 4.17. The guy who backs it up is the guy who made the promise. And he is able. <laughs> the rest of us, we're Seth or somebody. We're not able. That's for sure. So that's important. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, along with the third chapter, verse 16, reminds us, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, who lives in you. Now, see, hearing it is one thing and believing it's another. See, there's nobody in this room that, doesn't, that hasn't heard that and that doesn't believe that. Do you believe that? Hmm? You know how you really know you believe that? It's when it comes time for you to exercise that faith because your flesh is being tempted a different way. You hold the line and don't gratify your flesh. You don't gratify your spirit to have a bad attitude. You go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Then you'll find out if you really believe it. Oh, I know you know it. 
I know you know it and believe it as a biblical truth. But you see, what God, the Holy Spirit, wants you to do is not just to believe it on the hearing side, but on the applying side. That's the reason I call, I, I did away with the whole concept of faith and the faith rest technique because it didn't teach enough. And I developed what was called the faith cycle because there's two parts to the cycle. There's the hearing and believing side. There's the applying and completing side. And you don't have the whole ball game until you have the whole ball game. You can't play one half. You could be leading at halftime and lose the game. Where did Coach Wolliver, where was that school he taught at? Football. Which one? Gresham. Yeah, Gresham. Oh, God. Gresham. Every year, trustful, we would walk over there. We hadn't lost a ball game. The last game that we played with Billy, Billy was in ninth grade when we went over there. We played Coach Wolliver. We had him 26 zip at half. And we got beat. He was, a, listen, he was the by far the best coach I ever saw from halftime. This guy was a whiz at putting his team together to play second half ball and give them 110%. It's the best I ever saw. I played, I, played, I played ball with some pretty good coaches. He's the best I ever saw. And, and listen, every year you do it. Every year we would walk in there and be playing for a championship, and he'd get us. I mean, get us every year, no matter what way. 26 points at halftime, and you hadn't been beat all year? And, and he had a, had a way of doing that every year. A lot of years, we never could get that high on him, but we had really a good ball team, and he beat us. I mean, we, it was hard for me because I went, that's my guy. Wait, wait, that's my boy. Wait, that's my guy. I really had a struggle when I played against Coach. Look, do you not know? And listen, the idea of that whole illustration is one half is not enough. You got to have you got to have both halves to win. You got to have you got to hear the word of God. You got to believe it. That's not enough when it comes. That's enough, but it's not enough for life. That's enough for learning. You got a good learning skill going, but you don't have a life skill going because you're not applying it. You understand that, don't you? Mm. Well, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about in this text. He said, do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? See right there. You ought to circle that because I guarantee you, half your battles, you know, when you, you fuss, people call fussing, right? Have disagreements, they call them. You know what you're in? You got, if you're both in the flesh, you're both in the flesh. You know what you should do? You should call time out while you're in the midst of your flesh. Somebody ought to have the guts to call time out. Carry a towel around with you and throw it in, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whatever it takes, go get a white towel and throw it in. <laughs> and listen, you got to have, listen. You've got to come back to a spiritual place. You know what? You think you own yourself. You think you're the top guy. You think you're the whole cheese. You think it. Nah. Listen, your body doesn't even belong to you. Your body. For you have been bought with the price of Calvary. Therefore, do what? Glorify God in your body. You know where these arguments occur? In your body. I mean, wherever you are, if you're in a kitchen, they're at the ki in the kitchen. If it's a bedroom, it's a bedroom. If it's a car, it's a car. You understand what the body means? I'm not talking about the issue. I'm talking about the place. There should be no place. Somebody's got to throw the towel in and man up for Christ.
That's just in one area. That's fussing. What do you mean, fussing? You know, Adam and Eve. Well, we were just fussing. Yeah, but the rest of us drowned. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, as you well know, is one of eight works of the Holy Spirit, the package of, of 50 things of grace, salvation. Point four. Notice that the writer of Hebrews emphasized the importance of the new covenant ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, both in the learning and the applying side of new, new, new covenant doctrines. See, we're held to a, a higher standard than anybody else has ever been held. But we're equipped more than anybody else has ever been equipped. Huh? How about it? The Holy Spirit also testifying to us, the writer of Hebrews says, for after saying <laughs> that he quotes part of Jeremiah, I will put my law within their hearts and their minds. I will write them in their hearts and their minds. You know how powerful, how powerful it is to have the word of God in your heart and mind? I mean, where you can just listen. Because the Holy Spirit in John 14 uh, talks about, in 26, 27, he talks about teach and recall. Let me tell you, that time when you don't have a Bible with you and you got blood pouring out of all parts of your body and everybody's trying to find a pulse, and you know you're still present in this life, wouldn't it be good to be able to call upon the Lord in a, a word of comfort, the power of the word. Do you know that the power of the word of God can heal you? I, I'm not talking symbolic. I, I'm talking about actual heal you. You believe that? Al, you're going to need that tomorrow. He goes into surgery tomorrow. And probably not tomorrow, but Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. When uh, the surgery comes down to reality and the real life of the physical body. But Dennis's testimony that God can just do that thing, can he? I mean, just, and I was talking with um, Glenn the other day. He came to men's prayer breakfast. He said the same thing. He said, look, I, I, I'm almost ashamed because of all that to tell you, I've had very little pain. Uh, compare, I don't know what he's comparing a little to, but something in his head, huh? I used to play football with a guy. He said, I'm not in a little pain. His shoulder would be out of place. His knee would be, you know, and I would go like, <laughs> what do you mean? A little I mean, I'd have been home crying and wanting about five people to serve me something. <laughs> I know I wouldn't have been playing on a football field. I'd have been over there with the girls on the sideline cheering me up. I wouldn't have been out there playing. Not for football. He then says, and he quotes Jeremiah 31, 34, their sins and iniquity or lawless deeds I will remember no more. Is that not powerful? Listen, not only sins, but lawless deeds. I mean, that's the stuff that puts you in a wagon and takes you off and don't see you for years. <laughs> that's what that's about. Hebrews 10, 15 and 16 emphasizes the importance of inhale, exhale of the word of God, that learning and living part. Jesus taught his disciples at the upper room discourse prior to the cross, what we could expect as a norm and standard of the Christian way of life in regard to the Holy Spirit. I put four passages down, well worth your read. All right? You should really read these. This is what been promised to you by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This you can take to the bank business. All right, well, let me close in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our prayer section. I want to thank all those who came with us tonight by automobile and internet. And for those who come with us by internet, stay with us. This is Tuesday Night Bible Study.
we still got a long ways to go in Hebrews 10. So hang in there with us. Father, we're thankful tonight for the Holy Spirit ministering the Word of God through our life, through both the study and the teaching and the application to come. I pray, Father, things we've said tonight would what honor you, honor the word of God, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and us as church age believers to walk the walk, not just to talk. I tell you, if we could just get a hold of this one idea, our body is not our own. It's been, it's on lease, if anything, to us. It's our responsibility to bring glory to God through the way we conduct ourselves within our body structure. Our body. I mean, what does that mean, our body? This is where you are. Where are you now? Well, is it, they tell you where his body is. He said, well, I'm across town. I'm, I'm at work. Oh, I see. Well, then your body should, should be under the ministry of bringing glory to God. I'm in the home, wherever it is. Encourage your hearts, Father. We have the, the great ministry of the Holy Spirit in us. It makes us, I mean, when the Holy Spirit came upon people in the Old Testament, they just understood what an enormous, and that was just temporarily, but they understood what an enormous ministry flowed from it. I don't know that we understand that, Father, but we should. If we're cycling Bible doctrine, we know it. Because God does, when the Holy Spirit inter intervenes, when the Holy Spirit does stuff, he does stuff that's so far out the human, outside the human realm and Norman standard in the spiritual realm. Just a Norman standard, just a normal day at the office. Wow, Father. Let us get a hold of that concept in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not counting our sins against us he made christ who knew no sin to be sin for us